All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Joshua, if you would please. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. And uh, once again, let me just remind you that our prayer time will be taking place uh, this evening as well. We have been having some men come in, three men come in uh, before the evening service starts, and we've been taping our uh, prayer time. Each man, just like we do when we normally meet together as a church, uh, they pray for their particular section. And then what happens is that gets sent, and it will, should hit your inbox in about seven minutes. Uh, don't go there in seven minutes. We wait till after the preaching. But uh, what we are hoping the church family will do is that uh, you'll get the prayer sheet and that you'll be praying along with the men like we normally do. And I appreciate the men who have been coming in and praying for the church family uh, like you have been, taking your time out of your schedule and uh, making uh, the uh, prayer requests known to the church family. Appreciate that. And let me just say again, I probably should have done it during announcement time, but uh, if you'll call in your prayer requests every week uh, uh, until about noon on Wednesday, uh, that would probably help facilitate the prayer sheet being uh, given out. But I want us to stay connected as a church family. And so once again, the reason why we do it this way is uh, rather than during the live stream show it, uh, not really knowing who all is listening, we want to be sensitive to the proper names that we send out on the uh, uh, TV uh, uh, airwaves. And so if uh, you have a problem with that, you know, just let the church family know uh, in regards to uh, posting your particular prayer request and so on. But that's why we send it out uh, to our email list and not generally speaking in a church service. Okay, so uh, as you know, last week I started a series through uh, the man Joshua. I entitled it Joshua the Minister. And uh, I've got about 12, 13, 14 points to this message. And of course, as my practice, as I get going on a point, I just sort of park there. And I think we made it through the first two points. Now, what we had been doing, we had been going through a, a Bible survey, but I just felt like with the children's program being what it is, and they're usually not with us in the Wednesday night uh, service, we usually have the teens on up in the service here. I just felt like the program being what it is that maybe we would switch gears and have something just a little bit more generally uh, speaking to the entire family. And you know, I will be forever grateful as I've said before, when uh, a man gave me that book on Be Joyful and how to have a joyful Christian mind uh, right after I got saved, and uh, that was dealing with the book of Philippians. Well, I was also encouraged to pick up some biographies. And uh, people would say, hey, you know, you ought to read this biography. And I remember reading a biography of Jonathan Goforth. Uh, I also read about George Mueller and uh, just, just really spurring me uh, to look at individuals whom God used. And you know, sometimes, as I've mentioned, we have the tendency to deify uh, some of these people, but they were flesh and blood. In other words, they had problems and issues. They uh, sometimes had, uh, you know, temper problems, or maybe, the, you know, this, that, or the other health issues. Uh, sometimes we would find that they would be in conflict with other people, and so on and so forth. What I'm trying to say is not accentuating the problem, but just saying they're human. Sometimes as we serve the Lord, we expect the people that we serve with and that we come into contact with that name the name of Christ, that they be perfect. And if somehow they're not perfect, we get a skewed view of Christianity. We're real quick at times to say, oh, a hypocrite, or you know, they, they're not doing right, so on and so forth. And I'm not advocating for sin, of course. I'm not saying that it's okay to do wrong. But many times when we find ourselves crossways with someone, it's not because they sinned. We just may not like their personality. We may not like the way they do something. We may not like their ideas, their opinions. And so we have the tendency at times to draw lines of demarcation in regards to those individuals. And we say, well, I like this one and I don't like that one. 
That's really what was being addressed in 1 Corinthians when Paul wrote the church and says, I hear there's divisions among you. Some say I'm of Paul, some say I'm of uh, Cephas, and some say, oh, I'm of, of Christ. And they try to take what we would say is a holier than thou attitude. And Paul even reprimands them for that comment and says, is Christ divided? And so we need to understand that God only has imperfection to use. And so when we look at these Bible characters, uh, we get a real balanced view of how God used fallible man. God is infallible, but we are fallible. We're not right all the time. We do make mistakes. We don't set out, I trust, to make mistakes, but by the same token, we're bound to make mistakes. And so we need to understand that principle when we come to serving the Lord. And so that's why I like going into these Bible characters and just sort of pulling out the various truths. They had a particular purpose for their lives, to be sure, and God used them in a specific way. And I think in our particular context, we can learn from them. Just because Joshua happened to be the minister of Moses and then eventually the leader of the nation of Israel, well, I don't ever plan on being the minister of Moses. I don't ever plan on leading the nation of Israel. That might be a pipe dream, but it never happened. Well, the point I'm trying to make is God has a plan for my life and I can learn from others. I can learn principles of life. I can be encouraged in some areas. So when you read these scriptures and you say, well, look what Joshua did here. Don't just say, boy, that was a great thing that he did, or boy, this is a great principle. Try to apply it to your life. How does this affect me? How can I put that in my life, or how can I take that out of my life, or make sure I never let that into my life, and so on. So I wanna look at the man Joshua a little bit more in detail tonight and just draw some principles I trust that will help us. We talked about how that before Joshua was a good leader, he was a good follower. And we got that from Joshua chapter one in verse one where it says, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses minister saying, so right there we're introduced to the, the moniker, so to speak, of Joshua that he is a minister. That means he's a servant. Uh, he was at Moses' beck and call. And so before someone can really qualify to lead, they need to know how to follow. And that was a point we drew out. And, and one thing you also see about Joshua, and I may bring this out in another point, but the fact of the matter is Joshua never sought position. He just sought to serve where he was. And because he did not have aspirations for higher attainment, but just to do the best that he could do where he was, God recognized that, and unbeknownst to him, <laughs> Joshua was being groomed to be the next leader. And he just tried to do what he could to take the burden and help Moses the best he could. And so we see here that before Joshua was a good leader, he was a good follower. And then I say this number two, and this is where we really, I think, spent the bulk of the time last week, and that is that Joshua, in serving Moses, did not neglect his relationship with God. One of the things about a series of messages, as well as you talk about leadership skills and positions and characteristics, one of the problems is as you go on and you begin the process of explaining leadership principles, is people will say, well, you know, you're putting so much emphasis on this aspect or that aspect, but it's really your walk with God. And in Christianity, I would say, oh yeah, that's true. It's true in life anyway. But what I'm afraid of is when we get into these other points and we begin to make those emphasis, I want you to always understand that this particular point undergirds all the other points. Nothing else really matters in the message if someone as a leader does not have their walk with God down, where they don't have the good hand of God upon them. And so when we talk about leadership, that ought to be the primary thing that we get across to anyone and everyone that really is in a position where they're leading others or the, the, the people are following them, is it's gonna take 
a real uh, followership of that leader uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you have to make sure that your relationship with God is paramount, that that comes first and foremost. Now, number three, and this is charting new territory for tonight. Number three, it was interesting to me to read this, that the people determined to be loyal to God's man. Let's look at verse 18 of Joshua chapter one. It says, whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage. Now, of course, as a pastor and as a leader of this particular flock, so to speak, uh, we, I, I hesitated to put this down but really, as you travel through and study the life of Joshua, you see this principle acted out in his life as well as the people's lives. You see, uh, the people here that now are looking to Joshua as their leader knew that for many years he was sort of what we call second fiddle to Moses. He was the man that held Moses' coat. If Moses needed something, Joshua went and did it. We mentioned the fact that when they were fighting the Malachites, that it was Aaron and Hur and Moses on the mount, and Joshua was in the trenches with a sword in his hand, doing what we would say is the dirty work of winning the battle. And we talk about the dirty work of the ministry. And uh, it just boils down to work at times. But we see here where the people recognize that Joshua had been the follower, but was now the leader, and they're saying, we're gonna follow you, Joshua. You see, a leader needs followers. Someone said, if you think you're leading and you turn around and you look and no one's following you, you're just taking a walk. And so we need to understand that as far as leadership is concerned, if you have the privilege of leading others, be it in the business community, being in the home, being in it in the church. They also knew that Joshua was human. They knew that Joshua was human. If you look at chapter one and read these accounts and you read prior accounts of when Moses was alive, Joshua was flesh and blood. He didn't do everything just right, but by the same token, the people recognized that as well, but they did not let that deter them from following God's man. Now, Joshua was not a preacher. He's a political leader to be sure, and it was under, at this particular point, uh, a theocracy as such. And so, but yet they knew Joshua was human, but they said, we're gonna follow you. Now there's a caveat to that, like I mentioned, and that is that God needed to be with him. But they recognized that God was with him, and they said, look, we will follow you. And so we need to understand that principle the people determined to be loyal to God's man. And so they needed to be loyal to the one that God was loyal to. And they knew that Joshua was human, letter C, they also knew that God was with him, as I mentioned. They, and we'll see that in, in really in the scriptures here in just a moment. Uh, letter D, they determined not only to follow Joshua, but to stick up for him as well. You know, when you think about loyalty, that speaks of faithfulness. That speaks of standing up for one. Uh, David had that way, and David, we could go through his life and we could find all kinds of situations where he did not act uh, with the purest of motives at times. He also committed sin, and you're, not, you're never encouraged by God to follow someone into sin. But by the same token, the people knew that even in his humanness, once he was confronted of his sin and had to be rebuked at times, he got right with his God. And the people said, look, we're gonna follow him in those. That's where Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse one, follow me as I follow Christ. And so the people said here in verse 18 of chapter one of Joshua, he said this and will not, he said, whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death, only be strong and of a good courage. 
they knew some of his inadequacies, but they also recognized that God had put him in that position, and so they were going to follow him. And that's something that's really missing a lot in Christianity today, is we live in a generation of questioning authority, questioning why they do what they do and that kind of thing. And that's not wrong necessarily, but at the same time, when they have shown themselves in fidelity, when they've shown themselves to follow scripture, then we need to follow them. And sometimes we follow a leader uh, and we don't always understand some of the decisions they make, but as long as they're not uh, going against scripture, then we need to follow them. But that's something that is missing today. People want to be their own boss. They want to do their own thing. They want to call their own shots. Except, of course, if you go to a restaurant or you buy your gas, your groceries, or a house, then you'll do whatever you need to do to sign whatever papers you need to sign. But it's amazing how we won't keep that same kind of mindset when we come to the church house and deal with fellow Christians. We need to understand the principle of loyalty. Loyalty to God's people and loyalty to God's man. You know, there have been times, you know, all of us have a past. Some we would say are more sordid than others. Some have more skeletons in the closet than others, you might say. But you know, it's amazing that uh, I would rather stick up for people who have a past that have trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. God has forgiven them, and now they're trying to serve the Lord. I'm not going to sit in the seat of the scornful and criticize them and always remind people about what they did in the past and this, that, or the other, I'm going to rejoice that, hey, that may have been what they, they used to be, but boy, they, are, they have been making great strides to this point. That's a, that's a, a, characteristics of loyal, a characteristic of loyalty. Uh, it's not a matter of me saying that that person now is perfect because they come to Pimmon Valley Baptist Church. No, but by the same token, what they're doing is they're trying to serve the Lord. And sure, they may fall along the way and they may struggle at times, but hey, they're one of my family. They're a brother or sister in Christ. And I want to stick up for them. And so don't criticize them to me. You know, uh, you, st you, you stand up one for another. And these people were standing up for Joshua. And how many times do we find Moses and you'll see Joshua standing up for the people even before God? There were times when God got exasperated with his people and said, man, you know, let's just start this whole mess over again. And Moses stood in the way and said, oh, Lord, don't. He was sticking up for the people. There were times when Moses was saying, oh, you know, why did you put me in charge of this people? They don't even listen. And so, you see, then God would step in there and straighten Moses' attitude out. And so you see here, that's the way it ought to be in church. You know, I can remember years ago, we lived in Germany and we got to go home. We, we lived on base and there around Heilbronn, I know it was Ulm, I believe. And what we would do is we uh, would go home for, uh, for lunch. And, uh, I, you know, I'm the oldest uh, child in our family. I've got two sisters and I've got one sister two years younger than me and a, another sister four years younger than me. And, uh, you know, so I was big brother. And I heard one time about my sister Patty that some uh, guys were picking on her, you know, probably actually flirting with her, but, you know, they were trying to, you know, pick at her. And uh, so big brother, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick up for it. Now, you know, my sister and I, we could fight like cats and dogs, but don't you pick on my sister, you know? And so it, there's just something about that loyalty, you know? And uh, we need to understand that principle uh, of, as far as fellow Christians are concerned. We need to stick up for each other. I mean, it's a given that we're imperfect. It's a given you can find fault. Boy, who can, who, <laughs> who's able to stand uh, close scrutiny? We can't. God's still working on me. God's working on you. There's some rough edges still on me. He has to chip away here and chip away there, and he has to do some major surgery at times. 
But at the same time, hey, I want to serve God. I believe you want to serve God. And so let's help each other serve God. And that doesn't mean we accentuate our problems. That means we accentuate the blessings and we help one another. <laughs> Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. I'm just of the opinion that, hey, you know, I might see a Christian here and they need to be here, but I'm going to rejoice if they're here and I see that they come here. Oh yeah, that doesn't dictate that, that, uh, that they, can't, they shouldn't be here. They should be here, but any kind of forward progress to here, I want to rejoice and I want to help because God has been so merciful to me, why can't I extend that same mercy to someone else? Once again, I'm not condoning sin. I'm not saying that you can't rebuke. You ought to. I'm not saying that there does come a time where you have to do some intervention. But by the same token, I think we ought to give our brothers and sisters in Christ the benefit of the doubt at times. Because sometimes we don't know. We just think. We just surmise. We're giving our ears to the critic rather than knowing, drawn up alongside and helping someone in their distress. So it's interesting to me that the people were determined to be loyal to God's man. Number four, this is interesting as well. Joshua initiates a plan to fulfill God's uh, command. Excuse me, I'll get it out there in a minute. Uh, Joshua initiates a plan to fulfill God's command. Look at uh, chapter two, verse one. He says these words, and Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. Now it's interesting to me here that he sets the wheels in motion at this particular time to defeat Jericho. You say, okay, what's the significance of that? Well, you see, God told him he had the victory. God told him that he would lead him into the promised land. And so Joshua, though, said, look, we've got to initiate a plan, a strategy. You remember some 40, 45 years before this, they were supposed to go into the promised land. They were supposed to go in and conquer it, but yet they sent spies into the land. They looked it over and said, oh, we're as grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way that we can defeat these people. And so they shrunk back. They wander for all those years. They come back. And now Joshua is sitting or standing there on the precipice of this great uh, event, this battle that would have to take place, this crossing that would first have to take place. But he didn't just say, well, God said it. I'm just going to let him do it. No, he had to initiate a plan. He had to strategize, if you please. I say this letter A, he sets the wheels in motion to defeat Jericho. Also, as Joshua plans to conquer Jericho, he seeks the presence of Almighty God. It's interesting that even though God had given him the go-ahead prior to this point, all along the way, he continues to consult with God. He doesn't just say, okay, God said I'm going to do it, and I can do it, let's go. All along the way, he is seeking God's face. Let's look at uh, verse, uh, verse 2. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. So what was happening here is word was spreading amongst the people of the land that, hey, the Israelites are coming. They're coming. They're coming. And they wanted to somehow, some way, defeat it. And yet Joshua is initiating a plan to fulfill God's command. He was strategizing. What I can learn from that is when God lays something on my heart, when he gives me the green light to do something, go somewhere, you know, then that, that I, I still need to strategize. I still need to plan. I still need to seek his face even in the planning, just like we're doing with our building program. We feel that God has given us the green light to go ahead. Okay, so we still need to strategize. We have to plan. We have to look things over. We have to make sure we're doing it right. But all along the way, we need to have that dependency upon our God. Look at chapter 3 
in verse 3 of our text here, Joshua, he says these words, And they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God. The ark of the covenant was symbolic of the presence of God. The people of Israel knew that if the ark was in their midst, they'd be okay. And so here it says, Hey, when ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. In other words, when God moves, you move. When God doesn't move, you don't move. And so you have to be in tune with God all along the way. And so I say this, when you honor God, then God honors you. Look at chapter 3 again in verse 7. Very interesting passage of scripture here. It says here, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. Once again, you see the principle. Promotion doesn't come from the uh, east or the west, but promotion comes from the Lord. And here you find that God says, now Joshua, you haven't asked for this, but because I've chosen you to lead this great people, I am going to magnify you in the eyes of the people. But what has to happen? There needs to be some events that happen in Joshua's life that cause the people to say, there ain't no way we can do this. Excuse the English. There's no way that we can accomplish this unless God does it. We're going to follow this guy, but God's going to have to do something great here. And what we find happening is God will put you sometimes as a leader in some unbelievable circumstances that there's no way that that need can be met except God gets involved and does the work. In other words, you're not seeking the glory, you're not seeking the position, you're not seeking the magnification, but what God is doing is he is putting his hand upon you to bless you, but that means he has to put you in circumstances that make you depend upon him. Where is the ark of God? Just like Elisha, when Elijah went on to heaven, he grabbed the mantle, came over to the river, and he slapped that mantle and says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And just as this is in essence, Joshua was saying, where is the Lord God of Moses? And so you need to understand that, hey, you still need to initiate the plan that God has uh, given you, uh, the command that he's given you to move forward, to do what he wants you to do, trusting him to fill in all the blanks. Just make sure the Ark of the Covenant, in other words, the presence of God is with you. I say, when you honor God, God honors you. And it's not things you, we run such a fine line. Some people say, well, you know, I've done this and yet I'm still in the sorry job that I've always had. Well, why have you been doing all this? Has it been so that you could get up in position? You see, what we're doing is we're trying to manipulate God. We're trying to manipulate scripture and say, well, you look, I've served and I've done this and I've done that and I'm still in this lowly position. No, 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 you misunderstand. What needs to happen is you give your heart, mind, soul, body strength to God serving him and serving others, and you let God work all those other external details out. And he'll put you right where you need to be. And that's where contentment is such great gain, the scripture says. And so Joshua initiates a plan to fulfill God's command. Number five, I, let me just say this as I close point four. There is no shortcut cut to biblical success. It is obedience, plain and simple. <laughs> it's obedience, plain and simple. Number five, Joshua, the 12 men of the tribes of Israel, and all the people act upon what they've been told. Now, this is good. Uh, someone has said these words, miracles happen on the road of faith. Miracles happen on the road of of faith. Let's read this portion of scripture. This is uh, Joshua chapter 3. We'll begin reading in verse 9. The scripture says these words, And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither, and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, 
and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Now, therefore, take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe a man. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon the heap. I mean, look at this. When they crossed the Red Sea, God pulled back the way, the, the, the water, and they walked over on dry land. There's something else going on here. Here you see that as the men are carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, the soles of the feet had to touch the water before it would part. Think about that. They couldn't wait until the water parted and they could see the ground and see that it was solid and it wasn't muddy and that they would get stuck. They had to just take by faith and step out. Look what it says in verse 14. And it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overflowed all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up a heap very far from the city Adam that is beside Zaratan, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. But you know, that water was flowing. It was overflowing its banks, and those priests couldn't say, okay, part the waters, let's get it dry. It was wet, it was soaking wet, but God had told them to go, Joshua gave the command to go, and so they went. And as their feet touched the water, it parted, the waters parted. Not only that though, there was no mud. The Bible's very clear and says they went over on dry ground. And so here are the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, and those men are standing there as the people are crossing, and they're just standing there on solid footing. That's why I make the statement that miracles happen on the road of faith. If God says something, you have to step out by faith. You say, but I want to see that next step. You may not see that next step. You may want, you know, like, I don't know what to do next. You don't have to worry about what to do next. Just make sure you're doing right now. We're always worried about what's next. But we need to do right now. And as you do right now, trusting in the Lord, he'll take care of the next. I say this, quit being a know-it-all and start being a do-it-all individual. Sometimes we say, well, I want to know this and I want to know that, or I do know this and I do know that, when you just need to say, look, I'm going to obey God. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do when I'm supposed to do it. And let me just close with this point here, number six. So number five was Joshua, the 12 men of the tribes of Israel and all the people act upon what they've been told. Folks, what is that? How does that apply to us? That means when you look in the scriptures or you hear a teacher or a preacher preach the scriptures and they're preaching the word of God, you need to pay attention and do what the Bible says to do. Number six, I like this. Joshua, I like all these points actually. Joshua was concerned that the next generation knew the wonderful acts of God. Joshua was concerned that the next generation knew the wonderful acts of God. I don't know how many are sitting in their living room right now, and not only is mom and dad there, but you have children. 
And you're one generation and your children are another generation. You might be there as grandparents and you have your children there and you have your grandchildren there. There's three generations. And here is so critical for us to make sure that the next generation knows the goodness of God. And I was thinking about this point and uh, this afternoon I walked out of my office and I walked into the fellowship hall and I just stood there for a few minutes. Boy, there's a lot of good things that happen in that room. A lot of decisions for the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people got saved there. A lot of people got baptized there. A lot of people joined the church there. A lot of spiritual decisions were made there. You know, if we don't say, if we don't tell the next generation what God did, who's going to? I mean, it was a miracle the way we even got the property. We bought that property where the fellowship hall all the way down to the point of the road for under $14,000. When the next cheapest place for less property was in one of the housing developments and it was gonna cost us over $100,000 and then we'd also have to split the cost for road development. God did that. We didn't have credit, we were a new church and yet, hey, God made the financing available for us. God helped us pay that property off. God's done that. But if we don't talk about it, who's going to? I know sometimes people start rolling their eyes coming around December when I start talking about some of the blessings of the Lord upon our congregation and what God has done through the years. And yet, if, if I don't keep talking about it, who's going to? And we're going to have generations come up that they don't understand the sacrifices of some people. They don't understand the, the goodness of God to our congregation, how prayers were answered. And that's what Joshua was concerned about. Look at chapter 4, if you would, verse 5. The Bible says these words. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Why do you go to church? Why do you go to this church? Why are you so dedicated to God? Why, Daddy? Why? Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan, as the Lord spake unto Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there unto this day. I don't know who I'm really addressing tonight because I can't see you. But by the same token, I wonder how many parents made some decisions in this property somewhere. Has there been a time where you took your, your, your children or maybe you just yourself went and had a holy time with God where you just said, you know what? I made a life changing decision right here. This is about where I was standing. The other day I went online and I went down to, uh, I, I Googled the Kansas, Kansas City a Missouri Municipal Auditorium, and I tried to find the location. They've redone that place, but just trying to look over the shell of that auditorium of possibly where I was sitting the night that I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior right over there. And just trying to picture in my mind that, that holy place where I met Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that. You're not being scoopy, uh, scoopy. You're not being goofy. You're not being, you know, uh, you know, ghostly or anything like that. Man, you are just remembering the goodness of God. But we need to talk about it. We need to talk about the answers to prayer. Well, I don't want to brag. Hey, you're bragging on Jesus. You're not bragging on yourself. You didn't save yourself. Jesus did. And so you need to tell God about that. And you need to tell others about that. 
what God has done. Look at uh, chapter 4 and verse 19. And the people came up out of Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over." that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you might fear the Lord your God forever. We need to talk about it. You need to talk about the blessings of God that have happened in your life. You need to talk about the answers to prayer. In our prayer sheet, we have a list of praises. That section ought to be filled up every single week. <laughs> We are, you know, I stand up in front of my Sunday school class and I say, Sunday school class, any answers to prayer? Anybody got a blessing to share? And boy, it's just really quiet at times. Sometimes it's like pulling teeth to get somebody to say, oh, you know, here's, here's what happened in my life. Boy, it, it ought to be where all of us are just clamoring to say, hey, this is what God did for me, and this is what God did for my family, and we had this request, and God answered it, and boy, we need to talk about that. And you need to talk about some of the key events in your life, how that God moved on your life and did something wonderful in your life. That's what Joshua was trying to establish to the nation of Israel. Remember, there came a point in time where there arose a generation which knew not the Lord, nor the, the wonderful works that God did in their midst. And so if we don't tell the next generation who's going to, I'll tell you what the next generation will tell them. The next generation will say, hey, you know what? That fuddy-duddy religion of your parents, you need to live it up. You need to do this, you need to do that, and they'll undermine the Christian values that you've instilled in your family and in your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we just need to keep talking about the blessings of God upon our lives and upon the life of our church. Think about the decisions you've made personally. Think about the great decisions that have been made corporately. Boy, I remember missions conferences where the platform was filled with men and women surrendering to full-time Christian service. And how that many of those are out in ministry today. And many others are serving in other local churches, not in a position of pay, but just serving God. That's exciting. We ought to talk about it. We ought to let everybody know how God has worked and is working and will continue to work as long as we have him in our midst. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. I say this in closing, why not set up some memorials for the generations to follow the wonderful acts of God? I'm not talking about idolatry. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about where you talk about the Lord and you just say, hey look, you see that right there, it's amazing. We'll go on a holiday and we'll buy a trinket and we'll say, hey, you remember when? And we'll talk about some great holiday we had. How about having something there and you say, hey, you remember when God did this for us? Hey, family, boy, you know, hey, daughter, you were really sick at one point. And we prayed for you and God answered that prayer. You were only so old and, boy, we were really burdened for you. And God answered our prayer. And you talk about that. Let them know that God has been active in your life and in your family's life, and they shouldn't forget it. Dear Heavenly Father, help us, I pray, during this invitation time to remember some of these principles. And Lord, I pray that we would just talk about the wonderful acts that you've done in and through us. In Jesus' name. Pastor Matt.